Well, hello everyone. Um, my name is Sean Cypher Wall. Yes, love that, love that. Yes, I would love to come to Turkey. Hey, that's what's up. Love you. Yo, love y'all, love y'all. If y'all wanted to do something bigger with more medical students, like I'm totally, I think that would be great. And I would be totally into it. Yeah, um, so hello everyone. Um, my name is Sean Cypher Wall. I am an intersex activist. I'm originally from um, New York uh, in the United States. I am currently living in England, um, doing a research fellowship um, with the University of Huddersfield, as well as the European Commission, um, looking at social commerce in Ireland and England. Um, as to see why intersex people were excluded from uh, the equality and diversity frameworks. Um, I started doing uh, intersex activism because I am intersex. Um, I am one of eight people, uh, six living people in my family, but eight living, eight people in total in my family with um, an intersex trait um, known as androgen sensitivity syndrome. Um, because of Oh, um, because of uh, being castrated um, when I was 13 years old, um, because that was, um, let me see, because I was born with partial androgen and sensitivity syndrome, um, I had undescended testes um, that were in uh, sort of my groin area, and um, I was assigned female at birth, um, and I was castrated when I was 13 and put on feminizing hormones. When I learned about um, my variation, I was very angry, you know, and I wanted to actually fight so that another, a future generation of children would not have to experience what I have experienced. We all want the definition of concept we're talking about. Uh, what really intersex is? Um, so intersex is a set of um, sex characteristics um or traits or you know i would say sex characteristics so they could be your gonads um which are ovaries and testes hormones uh which we associate with testosterone and estrogen um let me see chromosomes uh that could be xx xy x um xxy and genitals um which we associate with um you know vulva vagina penis um, those are sex characteristics uh, that are atypical for males and females. Um, so that's a sort of um, working definition of intersex that was developed um, by um, intersex activists globally, um, but also used by the United Nations. Thank you so much. We can take uh, our other questions. Mm, hi then, I'm Remnur. Uh, I want to ask you my question, uh, what kind of activities were you a part of for raising awareness for intersex people as an activist? Um, so I think when I started, I started doing activist work in 2004. So I've been doing it for a long, long time. Um, and I started um, by giving testimony at the San Francisco Human Rights Commission in California. They had a hearing on intersex in 2004. Um, and I would say, you know, I definitely have um, spoken, you know, on, um, let me see, I've been interviewed, I've been on um, television, I have um, spoken to different um, media outlets. But I think my activist activist work started um, in 2011 when I joined the board of Interact, um, which is, I would say, the largest um, sort of policy organization dedicated to protecting intersex youth in the United States. Um, but they also work with intersex young people um, around the world. Um, I was board president for three years. And I think for me, even though I really um, liked doing that work, um, I feel like I could make more of a difference and more of an impact doing direct action. Um, and so 2016, um, I co-founded uh, the Intersex Justice Project um, with Lionel Stephanie Long and Pigeon Pagonis. 
um, which would actually push to end medically unnecessary surgeries in the United States. Um, and we targeted Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago. Um, and most recently, um, through years of activism, as well as um, social and political pressure, um, Lurie Children's Hospital was the first hospital um, in the United States to actually apologize to intersex people and institute a six month moratorium on intersex genital surgeries on children um, in the United States. Um, so that's kind of like the scope of um, my intersex activism. Okay, thank you so much. Um, hi, uh, I wanna ask uh, most parents, most parents assign their kids to a gender when they find out that the child is uh, intersex and you just mentioned that your parents did that too and how it made you feel. Can you talk more about your feelings and actually um, talk to parents for that matter? Um, sorry about that. Um, unfortunately, we live in a society that's very binary. And by binary, I mean that is um, the binary of male and female. And I think because of that, because of um, intersex children who may be born with atypical genitalia, um, it often presents um, a lot of confusion for parents but also clinicians as to how to rear the child. Um, and I don't think it's so much confusion for clinicians as it is bias that they feel that children should either be male or female. Um, so there are some parents who have opted to raise their children um, as non-binary or sort of like to use, um, I guess, sort of like gender, um, neutral pronouns like they and them um, until the child sort of like sort of lets them know what gender that they prefer. Um, but unfortunately, I would say at least in the United States, because that's the context that I know, um, children are still being assigned the gender. But what makes it problematic is that they're doing surgery in order to align the gender with the assigned gender, with the body. And I think that's what's problematic. And I feel like um, intersex activists, you know, I think speaking, I, I don't wanna speak on behalf of intersex activists, but what I feel personally is it's like, given how binary our society is, I feel like we should assign a gender, um, but I think we should also um, not do surgery. And we should also wait until the child is of age to consent to surgeries that, um, that they want. Thank you so much. Hi, my question is, um, people think uh, intersex, hermaphrodite, and transgender are the same. Uh, so what are the differences? Um, so a lot of people have used the term um, hermaphrodite. I think hermaphrodite probably um, is known in every language around the world um, because that's our understanding of someone who may have char sex characteristics of both male and female. Um, so hermaphrodite is, is not a sort of like, it's not politically correct, um, but it's also not an accurate term because intersex people um, don't have um, sort of like characteristics of both, right? I think if we think about intersex as a spectrum, um, I think intersex traits exist along a spectrum of biological sex characteristics that can manifest in the human body. So, you know, there are some people who are intersex who identify as hermaphrodite, um, just like there are people um, who are LGBT who may identify as queer, um, so as far as like reclaiming that word, I think it really depends um, on the person. I don't use the term hermaphrodite. Um, you know, I think some people um, may use intersex to describe themselves. Some people may not use intersex. 
Um, some people may use variations in sex characteristics. Um, some people may use DSD, which is differences in sex development. Um, doctors use the terms disorders of sexual development, which is problematic. Um, and transgender is different from intersex because for the most part, transgender people are not subject to medically unnecessary harmful surgeries and intersex people are. And um, transgender uh, is about gender, which is about how a person may perceive themselves and how they feel internally, right? So they want their biological or assigned sex to match with how they feel, which is gender, you know? Um, whereas intersex people, it's a bi biological reality that someone is born intersex. And there are at least 35 intersex variations that we know about. Thank you so much. Hi, um, I am Doa. I'm gonna ask you, uh, the most people think that the intersex people can't have a gender. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I think intersex people do have gender. I think everyone has a gender, you know, whether you're intersex or not. Um, I think some, if people feel that intersex people don't have a gender, I, I think it kind of contributes to sort of marginalizing intersex people because intersex people, regardless of how they're born, it's, gender is about how you feel. So. I was born intersex, but I feel male, right? Um, so I identify as male. Male is my gender. So um, yeah, I think we, I think intersex people have genders, just like people who are non-intersex. Thanks for your answer. Well, first of all, welcome. Uh, here comes my question. Uh, well, most people think being intersex is a disorder, and uh, what do you think about doctors' approach to this situation? Yeah, I think when we think about intersex as a disorder, um, we actually contribute to pathology. And I think the reason why intersex activists have pushed back against the term disorders of sexual development is that intersex people are already pathologized based on how our bodies may present. Now, not everyone, now, intersex traits don't necessarily manifest in infancy. They may manifest in childhood or adolescence. And some intersex people find out that they're intersex when they're adults. Um, so we, we really don't know who is intersex and who is not. Um, but the people who are visibly intersex are often subject to harmful medical interventions. Um, so when using terms like disorder, which was created by the medical establishment, it actually creates circumstances by which intersex people um, are subject to more harm. Because if someone is considered a, a disorder or not normal, I think it becomes easier to harm them. Um, so that's why, for me, it's actually a matter of pushing back against this notion that intersex people are disordered. Thanks a lot. Hi, I have a question related with the last one. Uh, what are your expectations from us as a new generation doctors? Oh, yes. Okay. So <laughs> I feel like as a new generation of doctors, I think I feel a, a lot of hope because I feel like you actually can change the system you actually can push back against this ideology that intersex people are not normal, that intersex people do not deserve the same level of care and respect as people who are not intersex. Um, I think they're, you know, I think what you're up against is a very conservative institution that says that um, intersex people, you know, have to fit in one box or another. But I feel like, a lot of hope with their generation because um, a lot of young people, because you have access to the internet, social media, you're actually able to hear the perspectives of um, intersex people who have been harmed, right? And now you're actually informed by the voices of intersex people. Um, so, you know, I hope 
that you can carry that moving forward. Because I think what intersex people want more than anything else um, is that we want, we are striving for a society where children get to actually um, consent to procedures that they want. Like young people actually can consent. That's the problem. It's not based on consent. Um, and so I feel like as a future generation of medical students, keep learning, um, keep listening, um, and actually um, push back against these structures that try to silence your voice as um, medical students. Because I think it's, it's going to require your bravery and to be able to step forward for what you know to be right. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Uh, how does people's assumptions about intersex people uh, affect your social life or education? Um, I think for me, I think there isn't a, a there isn't a lot of knowledge about um, intersex people. Um, there, there, there's not. We don't know a lot. You know, I think we're still learning um, about intersex people. So I think, you know, as far as my social life is great, it's fine, you know? Um, but I think it really depends on the context, right? Because I think if you're intersex, you know, last year, um, I submitted a report to the Open Society Foundations about intersex activism in the global South. And in some places, intersex is conflated with LGBT. And as a result, if people come out as intersex, they could be persecuted in the same ways that LGBT people are persecuted. Um, so I really think it really depends on context. I think we always have to be mindful of context. Um, I think for me personally, you know, because I grew up as queer, because I identify as queer as part of the LGBT community, I think I found more acceptance being intersex. And I think actually because of being part of the LGBT community, I've been actually able to um, sort of share my perspectives and get the love and support, you know? Um, but that hasn't been everyone's experience. And I think it is definitely a different experience if someone is born with an intersex variation and may identify as straight, you know? Um, I think that is definitely a different experience, right? Especially for people who don't identify as queer, who are gender conforming, um, who, you know, adhere to the gender binary. I think it could be really hard and really difficult um, because again, doctors are playing God and we don't know how children are gonna turn out. We don't know, um, we can't assume or make guesses about someone's gender identity from birth, we just can't. Um, and I think we should always, doctors and parents should keep an open mind around gender. Um, so I think as far as my experience, um, yeah. I, I think the one thing I would change um, is that before I came out as intersex, before I was a more public intersex person or figure, um, it was very isolating. And I think that is, um, is caused by um, just, you know, feeling that you're the only one. There aren't a lot of intersex people are out, especially when I was growing up. I think there are more. And I think social media has really been able to uh, connect intersex people um, but yeah, I think there's definitely more work to be done to create an environment for intersex people to feel safe. Thanks. Hi, uh, can you talk about support systems for intersex people? Do you think we can do more support? Yeah, I think what you can do as people on this call is to actually have conversations with your family, with your friends about intersex variations, right? To like let people know that intersex exists. Um, especially if you can talk to parents and parents who may be expecting 
or parents who already have children, just to let them know that intersex people are, are different but are normal, you know? Because I think sometimes for parents who give birth to intersex children, it's a very isolating experience, right? Um, and so I feel like what you can do is like raise awareness. Intersex Awareness Day is on Monday, you know? I think if you have social media, if you have Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, um, just to let people know. Right. And I think people may ask, people may be like, what's intersex? And you get to be like, oh, this is what intersex is. Right. Um, yeah, I think there's, you know, what I've been saying lately to a lot of people is that intersex education and being an ally to intersex people starts where you are at. So think about what you can do in your family, in your friends, friend circle, in your community, at your school to raise awareness of intersex people. Because I think that's where the work is, you know? Um, how many people have heard of Black Lives Matter? <laughs> so definitely a few people, right? So there may not be a lot of Black people in Turkey, but you have this awareness of Black Lives Matter, right? Um, and so the thing is, is that, and I don't want to make assumptions about, you know, the Black people in Turkey, but the thing is, is that, there may not be, um, you do not necessarily need intersex people in your neighborhood, in your community, in order to raise awareness of intersex people, right? Um, and so I think it's a similar, it's similar work, you know? And you can always reach out to people like me and other activists who are willing, you know, to work with you in order to develop those tools and strategies to raise awareness. Thank you. Hi, Safia. My name is Pınar. And my question is, uh, what were your family's feelings and thoughts uh, about you being an intersex person? Did they support you? I think, um, so in my family, there are other intersex people. But it was challenging because um, there's just so much stigma around intersex variation. So I think people weren't open to talking about what it meant to be intersex. So I often felt alone. I definitely felt alone. Um, and when I came out as intersex, like I had an uncle who's also intersex who threatened me. And he was just like, if I read my name anywhere, if you talk about this family, I'll sue you. And I was like, oh, you're okay, whatever. Um, and yeah, I, I do feel like that shows the impact of shame and stigma um, around these variations, you know? And I think the person who sort of took it the hardest was my mom. I think later on in life, she became more of an ally to me. Um, but I think my mom didn't understand it, you know? Because when I was born, they told her that you have a girl. You know, this is your little girl. And then when I started dressing in men's clothes, she couldn't understand. When I came out as queer when I was 14, she couldn't understand. Then when I changed my gender, she really couldn't understand, you know? Um, and so I think it was hard for her at first. But then when, you know, I would send her articles and I would talk to her. And I think when, you know, when... I think by the time she died, she realized that, you know, I should have just left you alone to develop as you needed to develop, you know, and what happened to you was wrong, you know? Um, and so I feel like, yeah, I definitely feel like even though being out as intersex, I think it has felt lonely at times. I'm glad that I am out, especially as a Black intersex person, um, to be sort of like an example for other people to step forward and not be ashamed of who they are. Okay. Some countries don't allow same-sex marriage. Right. Uh, is this an issue for intersex people as well? You know, I think it really depends on context again. You know, I think an issue um, that we've seen in the global community 
is that some people who are born intersex are denied identity documents. And if they don't have identity documents, they can't go to school, they can't get married, they can't adopt children. Um, and so, you know, again, I think it really, you know, depending on the context, um, intersex people can be discriminated against. Um, but I feel like specifically when I think about Kenya, for example, um, Kenya is one such circumstance where if, if a person doesn't have identity documents, they cannot be, you know, engaged in certain activities, like you said, around marriage or schooling or, um, yeah, or, a or even able to get an identity card, you know? Um, so, yeah. Thank you for coming. Is there anything we haven't mentioned, but you want to tell us about the intersex people's life? Um, I really, you know, who I think it really just depends on context. You know, I think it depends on the context. I think it depends on the cultural background, the cultural experience. Um, I think it's complicated by sexuality, it's complicated by race. Um, and, you know, I think what we'll see, especially, you know, with this Intersex Awareness Day is that you have people from all over the world who are sharing their stories. Um, and so, you know, I definitely encourage people, whether you be on Instagram or Twitter, to actually check out um, the stories that are coming out of different parts of the world, right? Um, like I've worked with um, activists in Mexico, in Kenya, um, Uganda, Zimbabwe, um, India, Russia. And I think it really just depends on where intersex activists are located. Um, some places people are out, like a lot of activists in Europe, right, um, are out in Western Europe, um, are out um, about being intersex, whereas in other parts, you know, like in Poland, for example, like people may not necessarily be out about being intersex, you know? That's what's up. Love you. Yeah, love y'all, love y'all. Yeah, totally. Oh, my dog, okay. Um, so yeah, have a good afternoon and keep in touch. <laughs>